Then, great. Uh, well, uh, I'm Anthony Shop, Chairman of the National Digital Roundtable and Co-Founder of Social Driver. I just want to welcome everyone today. Um, this event is really a perfect example of why the National Digital Roundtable was created three years ago. We saw the need to bring people together to discuss important topics and trends. And um, of course, uh, engaging and re-engaging students is a critical one that we need to discuss today. Almost every week, we organize small private roundtables where experts can meet with their peers. And we also provide hands-on training and workshops for organizations to build their capacity, particularly around digital. So we can ever help with any of that, feel free to reach out to us. I especially want to thank uh, my footpath for its support of this roundtable. For over 20 years, my footpath has helped more than 25,000 students return to college. Um, the firm has deep expertise in re-engaging and re-enrolling adult students and working with colleges to reduce barriers adults face on the path to degree completion. Um, my footpath's operation re-engage program in collaboration with its college clients intensively re-recruits students with a former affiliation to the college and helps them re-enroll and stays by their side through graduation. And having done a lot of work in that area, I think it's just a pretty amazing program. So um, we're really happy to have you all with us today. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Adam Shapiro, who is a member of the National Digital Roundtable Board of Advisors and today's moderator. Adam, I'll let you take it away. Anthony, thanks so much. And thanks everybody for joining us and to our uh, panel members on this round table and to my footpath uh, for supporting uh, this discussion. You know, many universities, even before the pandemic were facing a number of uh, headwinds. And um, I'm just making sure uh, you can see me okay. Let me fix that there. Uh, many universities before the pandemic were, were facing a number of headwinds, as you know. Um, you know, there's the enrollment cliff and increased competition from online and for-profit institutions. You know, and college leaders and admissions leaders right now are really interested in the insights from our roundtable participants today. Um, they know that the same old solutions focused on student marketing, recruitment, and retention no longer fully meet uh, the challenges that we have in front of us. Many college administrators, we hope, are aware that there are 36 million students who started college and they never finished, they never got a degree. However, there's still a lack of understanding, and you'll be hearing about this today, about the opportunity that this presents. We really need to discuss how to successfully re-engage and re-enroll these adult learners, especially as the economy takes new and different turns. Now, after the first part of our round table, we're gonna to move to a second part where we're gonna hear from Dr. Robert Scott. He's president emeritus of Adelphi University on Long Island. And he's gonna be listening to the ideas that these enrollment experts provide. And then he's gonna be providing his feedback and perspective from the president's chair. And, uh, and then we'll have uh, further opportunities for perspective and discussions as we go on. But let me start with Dr. Don Hostler. He's joining us live from Bloomington, Indiana, as they say. He's an author and senior scholar at the Center for Enrollment Research Policy and Practice at the University of Southern California. He's the author or co-author of 23 books and scholarly reports. He is a leading researcher and scholar in the fields of college choice, student persistence, student financial aid policy, and enrollment manager. So Don, welcome. And let me just go right to the heart of the matter with the first question. What are the institutional barriers that prevent re-engaging adult students? Uh, well, thank you, Adam. Uh, I think I want to start off first by suggesting there are basically some structural issues that involve both institutions and the students themselves. And I'm just gonna to briefly touch on some of the student ones. Uh, one is work schedules. And some, some of these potential students have flexibility in their work schedule. Some of them, their work schedule is changing every week. Family responsibilities also comes up in any research that's done on this topic. Of course, concerns about cost, loans, uh, and concerns over the time commitment. The, the light at the end of the tunnel can look pretty dark. Also, uh, unawareness of, op of options. And by options, I mean what careers are out there, 
what varied kinds of, of not only degree programs, but certificate programs. Uh, and of course, in this day and age, there's a lot of talk about stackable credentials, which I, I, think, are, I think are certificates, but sometimes not as, as well defined. On the institutional side, the almost opposite of that, our smorgasbord curriculum that many institutions pride themselves about because of the range of areas students can explore. For adult students who are working, often working students, often have families, the, and often maybe first generation students, the range of, of our curriculum can truly look overwhelming as well as timing when our courses offered. Uh, how far in advance our, our courses uh, planned and scheduled so that students could actually make some plan do some planning around their work schedules. Uh, research on, on these students. You think of, uh, certainly Mike knows how much research we do on, on potential first time recent high school graduates. Uh, that kind of research on uh, adult students who have stopped out or as later on we talked about the nuns uh, is often lacking. And often two year colleges, by the way, lack the resources to do this kind of work. Uh, their institutional research infrastructure can be uh, minimalist at best. Uh, institutional uh, barriers, department barriers, uh, getting ready for this, I shared uh, with Adam uh, very early in my tenure as, as vice chancellor for enrollment on the Bloomington campus, I, get, I got a really nasty email from the associate dean of one of our professional schools asking why we didn't direct more transfer students that way. I turned to our admissions office, who in turn gave me a list of the barriers that, these, that this professional school had itself that made it very difficult uh, for uh, students returning, students transferring. Uh, staffing, staffing levels. If you look at the staffing levels that are around, again, targeted at first, at, at first time students, nowhere near the kind of staffing level focused on transfers or focusing on, on re-enrollment insufficient academic and student support. A uh, colleague of mine, uh, Laura Perna at University of Pennsylvania did four or five years ago, did what seems like a really simple study. She looked at the web, she had grad students, look at the websites of admissions offices uh, and financial aid offices as it relates to uh, working students, uh, transfer students and Guess what? She found that they were very incomplete, often had conflicting information, uh, a whole range of problems that we wouldn't typically expect if we were targeting these things at, uh, as we often do at first at first time uh, first year students. Don, uh, unless there's an earthquake in Bloomington right now, I think the camera is shaking every time you talk. So maybe yeah. just back up just a tad or because we want to hear every word and don't be distracted. Oh, so that, my apologies. that sounds great. All right. Um, now, I understand uh, that your idea, your advice is that colleges need to be combing through the national student uh, clearinghouse for the data, that there's a rich trove of data there. Are they doing that? Do they need help doing it? If the data is there, why aren't they accessing it? Uh, again, I mean, the schools that are most likely to attract regional transfer students in re or re-enroll students are often the institutions with the least funding. I remember a uh, metaphor for this. Uh, when I was the, uh, uh, executive director of the research center. There was a, a gentleman in one meeting where we were talking about all the things that could be done. He stood up and he was, I believe from the University of West Georgia. He stood up and said, all of this is great, but you are looking both at the enrollment manager, manager for our campus and the institutional researcher as it comes, as it relates to enrollment efforts at my institution. Uh, and that really is a metaphor for a lot of schools. And again, we have this kind of perverse financing structure where uh, the schools that really need the most resources because they enroll the students who need the most help have the, have the fewest resources. And that's a significant problem. You know, in, in marketing, we often talk about the prototype, the ideal uh, 
customer or client. And of course, in higher ed, we're talking about a student. When we talk about re-engaging an adult student, who are we really talking about? What does that prototype look like? You know, I don't mean to duck your question, but in fact, the answer lies in the kind of question you just asked about the research that is done. Uh, the prototypical student in uh, New Albany, Indiana is gonna be very different from the prototypical student who is in a rural part of Iowa, uh, the prototypical student who is in Los Angeles or in suburbs of New York City. Uh, and it's, it's not just who's the prototypical student, but the, but the question is, and what are the kinds of programs and structure of degree programs that are gonna be, are gonna work best for those students? And the answers are going to be different depending upon where you are what kinds of students, and you have to really understand how your degree programs match or don't match the interests of the students. What does it say about the institutional design of higher education that we, we have 36 million students who didn't complete? It, it's, it's, it says a number of things. I think it says uh, one that both as a nation, as a state, uh, institutional leaders, community leaders, we don't really understand the wide range of preparation that students have, ha have had or not had to prepare them for post-secondary education. Uh, and we need to do that on all, all of those levels. Uh, and, and getting ready for this, found, found something really interesting. And, uh, I'm going to turn to Mike because he would be more up on this than you know, I know they've been a practicing enrollment manager for quite a while now. Uh, but I saw that the Penn State system had a, an ad about their entire work week focusing on transfer students. I then saw a former student who works for the Ohio State Board of Governors had had posted an, an announcement that for the state of Ohio, they were celebrating and focusing on student transfer week. I would, that's a very, very recent phenomenon that, that suggests policymakers at all levels are kind of slow to think, wow, I guess this is really important. I guess we have to focus on it. Well, and, and another aspect of this, and you, you touched on it a little bit, are you know what we are calling the nuns, those who were admitted and then they apparently never enrolled either in the institution that admitted them or to any institution mm -hmm. at all. What does that tell us? What kind of opportunity is there? Well, there, there are def definitely opportunities there. And I wanna just add something that I'll probably forget to say later. And um, here's the reason I'm hopeful about that. Uh, in the 1970s, early 80s, everybody was talking about enrollments were going to go down because we knew the number of traditional age high schools was declining. We are in a similar environment right now. And I think institutions, they're gonna be slow and they're not gonna know what to do and they're gonna need help. But I, I think we're gonna, I don't think those two announcements I saw are an accident around what we're gonna see, increasingly see around institutional intentionality around this. Can, can, can you uh, go down that a little bit further? Are you giving us a preview of, of something we should know? What, what are you referring to? Well, I did not know until I saw these two postings that this was National Transfer Week. I had never heard of National Transfer Week before. And again, uh, so I have been slowly reading less over the last four or five years. So I'm less certain about this in the last four or five years, but I'm pretty sure that prior to that, if there was a national transfer week, nobody had heard of it, or even more likely there was no such thing as a national transfer week. So maybe we need a, an adult learner week. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I think what I think is, uh, I think that's going to be reflective of, of one, they're going to, the focus institutions are going to start giving on those folks who need to re-enroll. But because those, many of those same students same share some attributes with the nuns, but they're also 
maybe not right away, but they're going to become an increasing part of this focus. Don, why don't we uh, wrap up here with uh, a story that I know you find interesting is this whole concept of uh, concierge service for adult learners. What's that all about? Yeah, I mean, uh, we can't underestimate the frequency with which adult students, including re-enrollers, uh, part of the issue is they never really saw themselves as college students. They were. They were never, because they weren't sure they could do this. Uh, when I was doing some work with the uh, regional campuses of Indiana, uh, one, the head of admissions at one school told the following story, that an adult woman, when she finally come in, shared that she had driven into the parking lot four times and gone back home because she just didn't think, she, she was up to this. The costs, the psychic costs of failure are high. Uh, and so in that sense, I think the concierge service, I'm gonna connect it with, uh, so this, is, this, isn't, this is not rocket science. I think I read about this 30 years ago. A school was talking about that they had a significant increase in adult stu students, especially in evening and weekend programs, when they sent every prospective student an invitation that included a special parking spot with an actual number of their parking spot. And there were people in the parking lot greeting them and helping. I mean, I think that really is a metaphor for the kind of service that especially adult students, the nuns, and, and many students we want to re-enroll. That's the kind of thinking we need to do. Don, thank you so much for those insights. and. We're going to uh, explore them in uh, greater detail with a program that's actually on the ground, putting some of these initiatives to work. And uh, the program is called Greater Philadelphia and the president and CEO, Malik Brown, is joining us now from the city of brotherly love. He's going to help us take a look uh, at Graduate Philadelphia. It was the first program in the country to align regional resources inside and outside of higher ed specifically to help adults return and complete a degree. Graduate Philadelphia was created to support the over 100,000 adult residents in the city of Philadelphia who had started but never finished either a two or four year degree. So good morning, Malik. Uh, 20 years ago, this started. Um, why was the program created? Was there something that wasn't happening that needed to occur in terms of re-enrollment? So sure, good morning, Adam, and, and thank you and the National Roundtable for having me and, and to our distinguished guests and colleagues uh, on this panel. It's, it's good to be with you this morning. Um, just to kind of uh, level set and ground us a little bit in the conversation, I, I would like to start by acknowledging the three co-founders of Graduate Philadelphia, uh, Hadash Sheffer, Sally Glickman, and David Thornburg. Uh, these are three pioneers and visionaries uh, in Philadelphia who, as the story likes to go, sat around at a coffee table uh, early one morning in 2005 uh, and really thought about the need, some of the economic and sort of talent development needs uh, of Philadelphia and, and came up with the idea of this adult comebacker and came up with the idea of graduate Philadelphia. So uh, I think you kind of hit on the answer in your opening remarks where you mentioned that we had approximately 100,000 uh, Philadelphians who had some college but no degree. Uh, part of that analysis was done by the Economy League, the United Way, uh, and the William Penn Foundation um, you know, at the turn of the 21st century. Um, and, and based on that data set, right, there was an acknowledgement that something had to be done to re-engage with these adults who um, you know, had a good amount of life experience, a good amount of work experience, some college attainment, uh, but never completed. Uh, and so many employers were looking for more diverse, non-traditional talent. Uh, we knew here in Philadelphia that we, one of the things that we frown upon and, and sort of, it's not, you know, it's not something that we want to um, highlight, but we are a large metro uh, with a pretty high poverty rate, something that we're trying to tackle as a, as a city. Um, and so to address that challenge as well, uh, we, we knew that one lever was educational attainment. 
Um, and, and how do we find a way to kind of engage those adults who are raising children, right, and are active citizens? You know, how can we give them a bridge into the economic mainstream in Philadelphia? So do I have this right? Your goal is to reach at least 1,750 new adults each year with information about how they can return and complete their degree. That's your, your goal each year to reach that many? That's about right, Adam. I mean, uh, roughly approximately over the last 15 years or so, um, Graduate Philadelphia has reached about 1,000 to 1,500 um, adult learners or adult comebackers. Uh, COVID was an interesting year, as I'm sure we can all appreciate, where that number um, decreased a little bit in 2020, uh, but we're starting to see uh, an upsurge in 2021, you know, where really people, and I know my colleague earlier mentioned the idea of stackable credentials, you know, short-term credentials. So Graduate Philadelphia, among a lot of great, amazing um, educational institutions here in Philadelphia, as well as some workforce development providers, are kind of working together to make sure that those that were economically dislocated due to COVID-19 last year, you know, have some on-ramps back into work, right? Um, and so that number of 50, between 1,500 and 2,000, we're really trying to make sure that as we move forward, you know, that we can exceed that number and really engage more, you know, more adults that are, are looking for our support and help. So when we talk about that on-ramp, that pipeline, you know, it's got two sides to it. You're focused uh, a lot on the students. What are the challenges on the other side dealing with the institutions that are part of Graduate Philadelphia? Sure. And actually, you know, Adam, thank you for the question. We actually, you know, two of our audiences, so we have three main audiences. We have the adult learner, we have our uh, college and university partners who are customers, and then we have the city and employers and, and, and the philanthropic community that are also key stakeholders. Um, so on the college and university side, um, as, 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 as the previous guest alluded, I mean, there are a lot of challenges. I do not envy, you know, sitting in the seat of a college president today. I mean, colleges and universities are increasingly asked uh, to do more with less, right, and to play a greater role um, in many of the economic development initiatives, workforce development initiatives in a city where traditionally, you know, higher learning was higher learning. And now it really is a laboratory, or I would say it, it continues to be a, a laboratory where, you know, colleges and universities can impact, you know, social and community metrics. Um, and so enrollment is, is, is a big issue, right? And, and figuring out more creative and nuanced and dynamic ways um, to engage and re-engage adult learners and adult comebackers, that, that is a challenge. Um, and so I think, you know, um, where you're seeing some, um, you know, light and creativity is the partnerships with nonprofit organizations that can help to provide a more holistic solution, right? Because many of the adults and the adult market fall into that lower to moderate income bracket, right? Where they're living, they're, they're, they're working, they're raising children, they may have an elderly parent, you know, who, who, who lives with them. And so, how do you sort of bring a solution to market, you know, that has uh, the adult at the very center, right, of your solution, right, human-centered design, right, so financial literacy, uh, child care, transportation, digital literacy, men uh, mental health, all of these things sort of are packaged in a way to support, to support the adult. What are some of the nonprofits you're working with in this? Can you explain this a little bit? Because I think this, this sounds very unique, of course. Yeah, so there are a lot of great nonprofits, um, you know, in the city of Philadelphia from, you know, Achievability to Jeb's Human Services to Diversified Community Services to Philadelphia Works, Philly Works, which is the, you know, Philadelphia Workforce Investment Board. I mean, all of these great organizations, you know, provide, uh, the Hope Center for, for, for Community uh, Injustice at Temple University. I mean, there are just a host of amazing organizations that sort of have their unique sweet spot in the market. So, you know, for achievability, it might be, you know, addressing poverty through rental assistance, through financial literacy. Uh, for diversified community services, it might be, you know, through their approach to early childhood education or two-generation impact strategy impacting the adult and the child. Um, you know, for Philadelphia Works, it might be the amazing career links that it, that it runs, right? 
Uh, and so again, for that adult, you know, how are we thinking about their needs, right, versus sort of the college needs, right? And we understand that colleges and universities, you know, they have to pay the bills, right? There's this sort of an economic model that we have to live to. But for the adult, it really is, right? You know, I have to, I have to pay my bills. I'm trying to, you know, make sure that I'm living in a safe neighborhood. I want to support my children. I'm going after a job that right now requires an associate's or a bachelor's degree, and I don't have that, right? So how do we kind of bring, again, a solution that's more holistic um, and thinking about the needs of that particular individual or, or adult or household? And so it's kind of like a wraparound services model almost that we, we hear about in a lot of places. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. How do you go about recruiting the students? Do the nonprofits help recruit these potential students as well or, or not? It's a great question, Adam. So we, we really believe that it takes a community-based approach. So while at a macro, at a systems level, we certainly have really good partnerships with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, with the City of Philadelphia Department of Commerce, with organizations like SHRM and, and the Economy League, and, and they really sort of look at the city, you know, I like to say sort of have a sort of an orbital view, right, um, sort of at, at a balcony view, right, but there's also the community level, right, where we build strong partnerships with anchor-based nonprofit organizations, social service organizations, neighborhood associations, uh, you know, um, community development organizations, because that's where, that's where you're going to find, you know, the community, right? Um, and if you don't have a presence, and like we like to say, boots on the ground, right, in those communities, then they really won't recognize your brand when you have a marketing campaign for you to go back to school. So we like to say that we really try to become an extension, right, of a lot of the community-based organizations that already have a relationship with you know, families across the city, right? And one analogy that we try to use is that if you ever walk into a Target, right? There is one recognizable brand at, at a Target, right? And, and what is that everyone? It's a Starbucks, right? So what we like to do is when we think about a community organization that's in North Philadelphia or South Philadelphia or West Philly, when they walk into that organization and get social services, we like to become that Starbucks, right? Where they can still walk away you know, out of that community organization or out, or out of that target and get education and workforce development services provided by Graduate Philadelphia. We also utilize the faith base. We have a faith based advisory board uh, uh, made up of 10 plus uh, churches uh, that oftentimes are the voice of that community and the influence of that community. And we also have an alumni ambassador program where people who have come through our program uh, oftentimes become the voice for, um, for Graduate Philadelphia and for people who are in their families and friends who want to come back to school and complete a degree. And on the institutional side, they have to have a lot of things in place. You have, what, about 12 or more institutions that are part of your initiative? Yeah, so it's, it's ebbed and flowed over the years. Uh, you know, just in complete transparency, uh, I, I became president of Graduate Philadelphia last November. Uh, and so um, a lot of the history uh, predates me, but I will say that over the, the successful long arc of, of this amazing organization, they've worked for up to 25 colleges and universities, you know, over the years. Right now, uh, we're, we're sitting at about 15 solid, you know, college and university partnerships, and, and we're looking to grow that as we move into 2022, uh, back to that sort of 25 to 30 range. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. So it takes a commitment on the the side of the college or the university to, to do yeah. this. Yeah, and it takes some, and Adam, you know, to your point, it takes some relationship building, right? Because colleges and universities, they have a lot of people who want to partner with them, a lot of nonprofits, uh, city agencies, and sometimes it takes more than one conversation uh, to really get uh, the, the college to see the value of what you're providing, right? And I think, we, I, you know, we like to say that, you know, uh, every relationship starts with a conversation. You know, and, uh, you know, we've been pretty successful at, you know, um, sustaining some really good relationships with colleges um, over the last 15 years. Terrific, terrific. Well, um, you know, we're at a critical point in this discussion because the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center recently reported that only 74 percent of students who entered college as first time freshmen in fall 2019 only 74% return to college for their second year. It's an unprecedented one year drop. We have a growing percentage of these dropouts and 
the rate for black and Latinx students is in the 60s, while Asians and white students are significantly higher in terms of returning. So what does that, that tell us about what we all are going to be facing, uh, those of us who are concerned about this, especially with uh, diversity on campuses? Adam, it's a great question. And I think that um, you know, we would be remiss if we did not sort of draw the correlation uh, that happened in 2020 with public health and sort of our economic vitality, right? So, you know, we, we have a number of great partners that focus on public health um, in, in the city of Philadelphia, the Public Health Management Corporation being one. Um, and, and last year, COVID really um, shined a light, right, on this correlation between sort of what everyone knows as the social determinants of health, right? So if you have higher educational attainment, if you have higher living wage employment, um, generally speaking, on balance, your you know, your, your psychological, mental, emotional, physical health will, will be greater. Um, you know, uh, black and brown populations were disproportionately impacted, um, you know, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, many of those individuals were working in frontline occupations uh, where they did not have the ability to work from home, as I did, um, and as some folks on, on our team, right? Um, and so, um, if you don't have the, 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 the opportunity to, to work from home because your educational attainment or your professional network or social capital or, or your job doesn't sort of provide sort of that work from home um, opportunity, um, then we can clearly see then this correlation between lack of educational attainment and lack of uh, sort of living wage employment and, 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 and um, more negative public health outcomes and metrics. Um, and, and so I'm not surprised when I hear that number 60% because for many, not all, I'd never like to generalize any group, uh, but for some black and brown populations, um, you know, you were already underwater, right, prior to COVID. Uh, and then COVID only exacerbated, you know, issues that, that, that plagued, uh, you know, some of our communities for many years. Uh, and so we're doing everything that we can. We're only one organization, but we believe in the power of partnerships. Uh, and we're doing everything that we can to re-engage uh, you know, folks that were really hurt by, uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, both from a health standpoint, as well as from an economic standpoint. Well, thank you for, for all you and your colleagues and supporters are doing. And we should say there is more information about this on Graduate Philadelphia's website. And there is also um, uh, a further network of other programs that have started based on what happened and what is happening in Philadelphia, and that's called the Graduate uh, Network. So you're in, I think, half a dozen other communities, not you particularly, but a half a dozen or so others who have taken this idea and have, have run with it and have learned from the experience. But it's, uh, it's a complex endeavor, to be sure. Yeah, and I would just say, Adam, if, if anyone sort of wants to understand the national model, I would encourage you to reach out to the Graduate Network. Um, Sally Glickman is the current president and CEO. Um, again, she was one of the co-founders, along with Hadass uh, and David Thornburg, that got the Graduate Philadelphia model started here in 2005, and then really expanded uh, that educational model uh, to a national model. Uh, and so I, you know, had the privilege of... Um, not only um, getting a chance to connect with, um, you know, other graduate, you know, communities across the country, but also being a part of the Lumina Adult Talent Hub, uh, which we were a Lumina Hub here in Philadelphia and connecting with some amazing colleagues across the country who are doing similar work uh, that we're doing here, here in Philadelphia. Uh, and I have to say hello to Dakota, who uh, was a strategy officer at Lumina and now is running Civic Labs and, and is really um, a champion for, for this uh, amazing work across the country. Thank you so much, Malik, and, and continued success. And now we're going to hop down to Orlando to Dr. Jeff Jones. He's Vice Provost Emeritus, University of Central Florida. Of course, we know UCF is one of the largest public universities in the U.S. and one of the largest institutions serving online adult students. Um, Jeff, tell us a little bit uh, about uh, your own situation. We know that you were a returning student at age 26, um, and we know no services existed uh, to help you at that time as they do now in some places. Are institutions doing better when you were looking to be a returning student yourself? Well, thank you very much, Adam. And before I get started, 
thank you to the Digital Roundtable and thank you to my footpath for getting all of us together. I'm honored to be part of this panelist. I'm seeing some, uh, some familiar faces I haven't seen in a while and some new faces as well. So thank you very much. Uh, it is true that I was myself a dropout, if you will, or a stopout as it turned out. Uh, 18 to 21 year old uh, student at a first generation student, which is a critical point in the story, uh, who really was directionless, if you will and dropped out with about 100 credit hours. And, you know, in typical story, started a family, worked a bunch of blue collar jobs with uh, very little upside potential. Went back to school when I was about 26 as an adult student, took night classes at Purdue University North Central, a regional campus of, in the Purdue system. Uh, at that time, the average student there was 29 years old and the average credit hours per semester was about eight. So I was the typical uh, story in many ways at a regional campus like that. Uh, I went on, on to IU South Bend where I was chief enrollment officer and worked with Don, uh, one of the regional campuses at IU and saw very similar behavior. At the University of Central Florida, which has about 72,000 students, we're the largest transfer receiving institution in the country. We take about 11,000 transfer students a year and I, I would suggest there's a lot of similarities between some of those transfer students and the re-entry students that we see. Uh, not all, some of the transfer students are on that 18 to 22 year old path and they matriculate seamlessly to the university, but there's a whole lot of people that have accumulated credits all over the place that were swirled between institutions and have finally come back. Now, I think one of the differences between the re-engaged students and the, and the transfer students writ large is the fact that the institutions have already at one time or another had a relationship with this student. Now the question is, was that a good relationship or was it not a good relationship? Was there something that the institution did that you know, helped our, uh, that student go off the tracks? Uh, you know, UCF is a you know, people think Orlando and they conjure up a lot of different pictures probably, but University of Central Florida is an urban serving institution. It's a minority serving institution. It's a Hispanic serving institution. And a little known fact is probably that Orlando has the lowest average wages of the top 50 metropolitan areas in the US, driven largely by the hospitality industry. So you've got a whole bunch of people who have some college have not completed uh, and are working in jobs that are frankly paying in you know the twenty thousand to thirty thousand dollar a year range, if that. And so it's a it's a tough situation, and there's a lot of people in the Orlando regional area, metropolitan area that really need the assistance. Now, on your question, uh, do do uh, do institutions get it? I would tell you that some get it very very well. Others don't have a clue. And I, th I think probably part of the reason for that is how have these uh, institutions had to adapt through the years? Have they had severe or critical enrollment shortages or challenges that have caused them to be a little more receptive to the student group? You know, my, my own personal experience has been unless there's some perceived pain, you know, you don't necessarily go to the doctor to get well. And you know, some institutions have had the enviable uh, market position through the years of not having to worry about uh, additional enrollment or how to come back and get these people. But even in those cases, you know, the mission really is how do you change lives and livelihoods? And even if it's a small proportion of your overall enrollment, if you're doing the type of economic development and community development that uh, Malik and others have talked about this morning, You've got you know you've got an institutional responsibility to assist these uh, these uh, uh, communities, I believe. But as someone who has come to that term, and you know, I, I also told the story of adult students who would tell me they drove there three or four times and sat in the parking lot and went back and came back. Today it's all digital, right? Today they're driving to campus by looking at your website. They're perusing the different degree programs. They're looking for financial aid information. 
they're leaving all manner of breadcrumbs, whether we like that or not, to tell us that they're, they're reinterested. They want some help. And to me, really being effective with this diverse population, to me, there is no prototypical necessarily stop out or student. Everyone has a story to tell. And to me, there's a radical difference, first of all, between academic advising and coaching but really begins with that dialogue of why do you want to come back to school? And if you can reach that why, then I think the how and the what and the where will soon follow. You will find that students declare early on that they're there for a variety of really good reasons. They're there because they wanna be a role model for their children. They're there because economically they're boxed in and they don't have very many options. They're there because there are very few uh, available uh, ways for them to learn to live a better lifestyle. So these, these really become the keystone questions. If you can, you know, everyone reaches a point where they're, you know, frustrated, disillusioned, uh, discouraged. And at that, time, at that point in time is when you need to reach back to those students and say, you remember why you've re-engaged with us? Do you remember the reason that you're here? You have children that are, 11, you know, whatever that story is. And, and that, that is really what keeps people in the harness. And, and the, the, the rest of it, you know, is kind of, uh, is detail oriented. Because, every, you know, everyone has a reason that they need a variety of different services. And I think as Malika pointed out, you know, it could be mental health, it could be economic, could be child care, could be elder care, could be a ton of different things. But really, uh, in, in this situation, we have effectively, through the help of partners like my footpath or someone else, we've effectively re-engaged with those students. But now how do we retain those students? You know, we talked about recruiting, we talked about re-engaging, but how do we now retain those students? Because something let them down the first time around. And I'm not saying it's all the institution's fault. Many personal issues get in the way. Maybe the student wasn't ready. Maybe they weren't academically prepared at that point in time. But there was a reason that they did not complete the first time. Was it economic? Was it social? Was it family responsibilities? If you can get to the why and then enable those students to seek the right kinds of help, you have done them a great service, which is a lot different than advising students on how to fix their problems. But, but Jeff, and, on the flip side of it, what's going on in the admissions office, in the enrollment office, are they really geared up and ready to recruit these students and then to deal with them when they come in? You know, uh, I think most of us who've been doing this kind of work for a while would probably agree that there is no single flavor out there. Some institutions, again, are well equipped to do this work in a central office, others aren't. Uh, some would have absolutely, some admissions officers would have absolutely no responsibility for that student after they've been accepted into the institution. They're then turned over to other service units. Uh, you know, so it, it varies depending upon where you are. But I think uh, one thing remains clear. Uh, navigating complex organizations is a life skill. Whether it's higher education or whether it's, you know, unemployment uh, system or whether it's healthcare, uh, helping students understand how to navigate complex uh, organizational patterns is a life skill that they will never, never not use. And so what we need to do as educators is help them figure out how to access financial aid and how to select classes and how to do this career research that's gonna lead them to you know, a very highly fulfilling economically and otherwise career path. This is where the work really begins to pay off. As our dear colleague, Bill Bowen said in, in crossing the finish line, there is no economic benefit that accrues to a non-finisher. You can have 
100 credit hours like I did and people don't care, even though you may have gained significant knowledge on how to do a better job. What they want is that credential and getting people across the finish line to that credential, I believe is the key to getting the economic lift that we all know is possible for a college graduate. Do you think institutions have a quantitative handle on how many students have attended and have stopped out? Do they know who these students are, how to reach them, how to engage them? In my own personal experience, the answer is no. Uh, unless they're very, very intentional about it and deliberate, and, and it can be done, you know, and everybody has the data. The question is, do they have the information? Uh, they know who's been there. They know what their age is. They know if they've had uh, credits uh, earned from that institution in the past. They know their academic standing. They know if they've got loan debt. They know all of these things. Have they intentionally set out to learn about those students? And I would tell you, I don't think a lot of institutions have done that. There are some that are elegant in this approach, but they are the ones that are winning in this, if you will, this uh, marketplace for adult learners, because the adult learners have a set of expectations that is different than an 18 to 19 or 20 year old student have. And we all understand that because we're all doing our online banking and so on and so forth. But the facts remain, uh, you have childcare, you have many other institutional things. Uh, one key question for this is, does your institution have some means of declaring academic bankruptcy? Okay, because you might have a student who was there 15 years ago that did two semesters of straight Fs on the way out the door. And if they have to go back and retake all of those classes to overcome that hurdle in your own institution, they're better off transferring because if they go to the transfer institution, those courses are gonna get redlined. Sure, they're not gonna get credit for them, but they're also not gonna to have to retake all those things. So a key question is, does your institution have any means of academic bankruptcy? Because a, a, you know, a fresh start is a fresh start and, and these people are not the same as they were 10 or 12 years ago, despite our institutional uh, Wow, Jeff, great information there and great insights. Thank you so much from uh, sunny Orlando. And now we're gonna hop over to San Jose to another sunny location and Mike Sexton. He is the former vice president for enrollment management at Santa Clara University. Mike, you're a highly esteemed enrollment manager. Over 40 years, you've coached hundreds of enrollment professionals through your work at Rhodes, uh, Lewis and Clark Colleges, Santa Clara, of course, as well as NACAC uh, through the Common App and the Graduate Enrollment Management Certificate Program at USC. So my question to you to start off is, what's your perspective on the training done in the higher ed sector around re-engagement and re-enrollment? What, what training is going on? Pretty much nil. Um, it's, it's one of those things that we've been used to just replacing the leaky pipeline with more people at the front of the pipeline. And the leaks are getting bigger and the pipeline is getting smaller. So sadly, the metric that the universities are looking at the colleges, did you get the class, the new class? And what happens to those that are currently there, they just assume that takes care of itself and it doesn't. So very little training. Okay, we're gonna be talking to a former college president about that soon um, and uh, what we could or should be doing. But sticking with you here, um, how do we create this better training environment? How do you as professionals in this part of higher ed uh, advocate for this and make it happen and, or, or bring in consultants or, or what, what have you? How do you raise your voice to make this happen? Because we know the enrollment cliff is here. That's not so gonna think, solve the problem. Right. I think the key thing is uh, you've got to be at the table. And most presidents now realize that enrollment, other than the campaign year, might be bringing in more revenue than the development office. So the enrollment person, I think, needs to be at the table, particularly having a relationship with the CFO, 
so that number one, you can identify the problem and you can present a solution. And when they see the bottom line implications, and this is true even before we get to the 2025 demographic cliff, that retaining somebody is cheaper than recruiting a new person because discount rates are going up, et cetera, et cetera. And we've, we've kind of gotten to that mindset that there are certain subpopulations that do need different attention. We do it for international students, for veterans, for transfers, for first gen. Why not these stopouts and dropouts? The thing is, there's nobody having that in their job description. I would guess at 98% of the places. Uh, so if there if there's no job description for it, are there budget dollars allocated for it? No, Probably it's it's, <laughs> it's the old uh, follow the money, right? And uh, again, if you can get the ear of the CFO and say, you know, we could we could get these people back here. It's going to improve our local reputation, our national ranking, our graduation rates, all the things metrics that are, that are important elsewhere have to start with keeping the people that we've in admissions and enrollment we've had a two-year relationship to get them in the door or to get them admitted and then they're the handoff three days of orientation and you think you're done and then it's somebody else's job but unfortunately in our minds even if we admit the person you have to recruit them to re throughout the summer so they don't melt Hopefully, somebody at the institution is recruiting them, recruiting them to return as sophomores. You have to make it worthwhile. And I think there's some measurements and metrics that other offices need to be held accountable for, much the way the admissions is. So a personal story for me, I once was uh, on a, an esteemed uh, college campus and was talking about some of these themes. I, you know, I wasn't heavy duty talking about marketing, but uh, a little bit touching on some of these concepts. And a faculty member raised her hand and she said, um, Mr. Shapiro, I'm sure you're accomplished at what you do and I'm not doubting what you're talking about makes sense. But you have to understand we're at an institution of higher learning because we want to be removed from the market forces you're referring to. <laughs> and, and she was, um, I will say she was offended by the tone and the background information that I was uh, bringing to the table. Now, have you run into this or was it something that I said to her that set her off? Now, how many of us know that faculty member? <laughs> yeah, um, they just think anybody can do admissions, right? Just go out, hit the road, show them a view book, tell, us, tell them about the faculty and they'll just arrive. They don't realize the sophistication of recruitment, particularly on a national scale, international scale, that it's much more that you've got to do this matching process. And the faculty, God love them, um, you wouldn't want them running the admission office uh, because they're not necessarily the, the experts. I don't want to run their classes either. But, but there comes a time when you have to say, like my elementary teacher daughter you have to meet the student where they are and a 16 and 17 year old is in a very different place whether they're in philly or new york or whatever uh don mentioned earlier about the transfers i'm in california we have 112 community colleges you better be able to talk transfer because there's tremendous pressure by the state to keep our state grant at the private schools if you make efforts to recruit transfers. They're all over the UC system and the CSU system. They also want the private sectors to say, you need to take transfers too. And, and we do it in a big way because why not? They're right there. Um, another point people made about the pandemic, we're probably better suited now infrastructure wise to address some of these students that have left. We're used to doing things online asynchronously. It's not a nine to five world anymore. And I think that's probably helping in a way, but it's still gotta be in somebody's job description. And in most people, they don't have the staff for that. They're just used to admissions going out and getting new ones. And they perceive that as an easy thing to do, but anybody who's been in the field knows it's not easy. 
Okay, well, we're, we're going to have a good conversation then with President Emeritus Scott about this. I know he's soaking this all in. But um, again, just to be devil's advocate here, what about the idea that, you know, if somebody went to a restaurant and didn't have a good experience, why should that restaurant try to get them back? Because maybe they don't like the food, it's not the right location, the price point isn't right for them. So is that part of the mentality on campus as well? Hey, they tried it, it wasn't for them. Wouldn't it be better to go after a new customer, a new 17 year old than trying to change a 30 year old's mindset? It's gotta be both and. You can't just switch one for the other. Look at the other operation on the campus that brings in revenue, the development office. They have an army of people that will deal with friends of the college, alumni, donors, may have given a gift once and they stop. They don't let them go. <laughs> they, go they go after them again and again. And there's a certain equivalencies that make a lot of sense. When you think about the staffing, the salary structure, this is an age old argument that admissions people have about development is overvalued or admissions is undervalued. But because they see the, re the rationale, the metrics will show that they can get them back. Well, I think we need to try the same thing. Who's going to do it? What about this idea of outside help, coaching? looking at peer best practices in re-engagement. We've heard a, a lot of ideas in the past hour here. Is this valuable to the admissions offices and, and where do they get these insights? Well, well, I think every operation on campus probably uses some degree of technology and consultants. And I think since presidents aren't gonna just find new FTE to do all of this, that may be the most efficient way to do it for many people, but there's still the who's in charge, who's going to coordinate this. And again, with this, your new best friend, the CFO, you have to be able to say, if we do this, we get that, you know? So we're all about starting a pilot program, trying this. And if they can see, yes, that's going to help the bottom line, that's great. And again, let's not forget, we're talking about human beings that are graduating with debt, right? And even worse, those that aren't graduating with debt. That does get measured as much as the, the poster child of the art major has $200,000 in debt, but they graduate with an art degree. It's the ones who didn't even graduate that have debt that I think are the least served and the ones that we could perhaps get back and change their lives a little bit more. What's the future? What do you see on the horizon uh, in this space? We've talked about some of these pandemic numbers. It seems like, I mean, if we're at 36 million, it strikes me uh, the number's going to go up exponentially. Well, I think, you know, the, the traditional route, and I worked at mostly traditional schools, um, you can see that that demographic change. And to compensate, you, you do more transfers, you do more international find other other sources but the again the leaky pipeline is they were on your campus they were they visited they were admitted you have this relationship and you just let them go away and even those that are enrolled and transferred or they don't come back they're in attrition maybe you have the exit interview where they have to answer 10 questions and the answer is why they're leaving are personal number one financial number two, but you really don't know. You have to come back to them a little bit later when it's not in the heat of the moment of what is it? What, what would it take to get you back? And unfortunately, the recruitment admissions enrollment operation is very different than the readmit operation, which in many places is run by the registrar or academic advising. They're not recruiters. Um, and so, I think one of the best things that has grown recently is the growth of the one stop where there are some people trained with the multiple knowledges of all of the offices that are gonna to have to be involved, financial aid, admissions, registrar, advising, to say, here's what it's gonna to take to get this person back. And these policies, be it academic bankruptcy or 
flexibility and flexibility and registrar usually are not in the same sentence. <laughs> so you, you need to make some academic uh, adjustments if you're serious about doing this. Right, indeed. Mike, thank you so much. And, and uh, hang on here because our, we're going into the second part of the program here. As promised, we're going to talk to Dr. Robert Scott, President Emeritus, uh, Delphi University. He's joining us today from New York City. Bob, you, we know your background is unique as you're the only person to hold the top three positions in American higher ed. You've been head of a public institution, a state coordinating board, and led a private university. So sitting in the president's chair with your perspective, what do you think of what you've heard this morning? Oops, and you're on mute. We're going to ask you to unmute. There you go. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, and it's wonderful to meet my new colleagues. Mike mentioned two things that I'll pick up on. He talked about the development office. The irony is that alumni and development office are trying to solicit from all those who dropped out because they're counted as alumni but the admissions office is not. The second thing is I would suggest when talking about your new best friend, you include the chief academic officer. I was a consultant to a college last year, a uh, year and a half ago, uh, that was concerned about enrollment. And so I examined not only the admissions statistics and so on, but I also examined the curriculum. And when I asked the president and the chief enrollment officer and the head of the faculty senate and the CFO was there. Why it is that a couple of the normally popular majors required 134 and 138 degrees to graduate. I said, it's no wonder you don't have students entering as transfers. They can't, you can't guarantee they'll graduate in four years and you have students who because they can't change their major leave because they can't graduate in four years or five years. I think, I mean, why do we have 36 million? I would suggest several things. One of the big problems in American higher education, at least American, is the lack of alignment. You think about these variables, the lack of alignment between mission goals and priorities, the use of resources, the reward structure and results. Our mission statements are to teach students and often to prepare them to become leaders. And the results is overall under 60% graduate even in six years. So if we look at the alignment between mission, goals, priorities and use of resources, how much of our resources do we put into advising and counseling and career counseling and connecting them uh, to our student development and our learning programs? What is one of the major forms of compensation for full-time faculty other than salary and benefits? It's release from teaching. And so we put our resources into full-time faculty tenure track and then we reward them by letting them do something else, often not related to students. And we replace them with part-time faculty who don't have a, an office or the time to advise students. I think one of the big problems and causes is this lack of alignment. And it's a structural issue. Um, for, and what I just mentioned, the relationship between admissions and the curriculum. Another major force uh, is that all of the incentives and pressures are to focus on, uh, someone said, the top line, the new enrollment. That's what the rankings focus on. Uh, that's what the accreditation focuses on, although they more and more talk about uh, uh, graduation rate, bond rating, agencies, they want to know what your yield rate is of new students. Uh, the foundations, 
the freshman profile is a major source of institutional uh, prestige. And so even transfers are in uh, second place. And so I think because of the demographic changes and the cliff, uh, the significant change in international student enrollment, which is not gonna be corrected by a change in federal policy because other countries have been going after international students for a long time. Uh, we need to think about new populations, including uh, recruiting again those who were enrolled but left, uh, as well as those who uh, graduated from high school but didn't go to college. Uh, but recruitment is not the end. Uh, I recall a session when I first got to Adelphi, a session with some alumni, and one who was a, a very senior corporate executive told me uh, told us a story about when she came to get her MBA at night. And she described it as a fast food experience, a turnaround ex drive through experience. She said there was no coffee, no food, no advising, no counseling. And I thought, and then we talked about my staff, if we want these students to be engaged, we have to help them. You know, if the registrar and the academic advising staff leave at five o'clock and we've got students here until 10 o'clock, they're gonna be left alone and they may not stay. We were lucky this one stayed. Um, years ago, and, and I think actually Adam, a, a better analogy than to a restaurant is to the magazine business. Uh, and years ago, I read uh, that the then uh, publisher of the Saturday Review magazine, Norman Cousins, called an advertiser and a subscriber each night be before going home. And I thought, what a brilliant idea. And so I started calling our corporate donors who we wanted for internships and and career placement for students, as well as school superintendents over the years. I did it at Ramapo College, I did it at Delphi. And it's amazing what one can learn by asking them and current students, faculty and staff, what is going well? What do you wish we had changed last week? And I learned so much in doing that. And I think that, by the way, those stories help with fundraising narratives too. But I think we need to have presidents who are chief purpose officers, chief mission officers, who think about this alignment between mission and results. And in that way, we can have what I've always called enrollment by design. What is the design? You've got the input ingredients and their various levels, but you've got the output. You've got the mission fulfillment in terms of graduation rates. Um, and that's why I would add in uh, the academic programming and advising as well as career services uh, for students at all ages. Uh, I think you've all made very interesting points. I wanna learn a lot more about graduate, uh, especially graduate Philadelphia since I lived there for a while but your experiences are just right on point. Bob, um, what, now you're on board with this, but with your peers who are serving as presidents and, and others as CFOs and so forth and so on, how does, how does somebody in admissions go and make the case, hey, we need you know, a line budget item to do re-engagement and it's going to involve these aspects and we're gonna bring in this support. We're gonna bring in someone to help coach us, someone to help us go through the clearing house. Uh, maybe it involves phone calls or emails or, or this kind of one-on-one -on -one engagement. I mean, this uh, you, you know, can start to add up, but how do they make the financial case to someone who's not as uh, inclined to think this way as you are? Well, 
many institutions, as we know from this conversation, have vice presidents for enrollment management. And those persons sit on the president's cabinet to meet with the president uh, and have the opportunity to uh, make recommendations. So how do we influence those people? Uh, let's hope that they uh, will read your white paper. Let's hope that they go to professional association meetings. Uh, and let's hope that there is some younger ed admissions officers uh, who ask questions. My first job in higher education was as assistant director of admissions at my alma mater, Bucknell University. And one of my first questions, not the first week, but over the course of the first year to the director was, why don't students accept our offer of admission? Why do students accept our offer of admission? And those first two publications of mine uh, then led to other opportunities. I know there are other Bob Scotts out there asking questions. Um, it's up to the vice president for enrollment management and his or her colleagues uh, to see the bigger picture, especially uh, when they're engaged in strategic planning and annual budget setting uh, and talk about goals. And they better talk about graduation rates and then move back the algorithm to see, all right, if we're gonna improve the graduation rates, what else do we have to do? Great, great. Well, we're almost coming up to 12.30 Eastern uh, when we're gonna sign off, but uh, I think the easiest way to proceed would be if anybody who is watching has a question, I think the easiest thing would be put the question in the chat and uh, I will read it off um, and, and ask our panelists uh, uh, for their uh, response to it. But I'd like to go to kind of a free-for-all discussion now and ask our panelists who are still on with us, okay, here's your chance. You've got uh, a president uh, emeritus. Put him on the spot. What questions do you have for him about this topic? What are your frustrations? Don, you look like you're ready. Yeah, uh, and, and actually, this is this is to both. This is a strategy for both presidents and for CFOs. Never ask for base funding. Always ask for one-time dollars. Make pitches around the one-time dollars for return on investment. And that leads into why it's often easier, to, at least, to get started to bring in. Uh, a group to work with you than to start it yourself. CFOs and presidents get nervous about adding a lot of staff that start to look like permanent salary commitments. Yeah, Don, Don, I think, Don, I think it, that's a really good point. And, and another way to frame it is to talk about points of leverage. We want to accomplish this according to our strategic plan. Here's a, here's a point of leverage for helping us get there. And that's your one-time funding to get things started. We can't, we can't hire enough people and ramp them up soon enough. Plus we end up, we end up nobody likes to let people go. And that's but not, even, not even cold hearted CFOs like to let people go. So one-time funding and often seek a support groups to work with consultants so that you're not initially saying, I wanna spend all this money, I wanna hire all these people, but rather here's a three-year plan, we're gonna do it for three years only, we're gonna evaluate it rigorously, and we, in order to do it in that time frame, we have, uh, we have to get started away with people who know what they're doing. Who doesn't love a good pilot program, right? Uh, Jeff Papa is uh, listening and he asks, What's the best strategy for developing an effective relationship between marketing and enrollment? Well, in many offices, they, I mean, many institutions, they're in the same office. Well, well, <laughs> and that may be, well, so, that's not even a guarantee they get along. <laughs> right. But uh, I, we can I try. Would have I would have to tell you that throughout my career, I saw a convergence of marketing and enrollment that was not there at first. Uh, 
I was chuckling earlier when somebody was talking about, you know, the faculty member that said we're above marketing. Uh, I, I remember fondly when I suggested a long time ago that one of my titles become director of enrollment and marketing. And there was a reaction. There was a there was an adverse reaction to the use of the word marketing in higher education. I, were, I remember going to one of the first symposium for marketing in higher education was run by the American Marketing Association. And it was like this little coffee club because nobody really thought about how they were marketing higher ed. And, you know, anymore, you're just like, you're tied at the hip. You know, if you don't have a great relationship with your marketing people, then woe is you. And, you know, I would suggest you figure out like, just like building these relationships with our students, you have to figure out how to work uh, well yeah. with these folks, how to appreciate their sophisticated knowledge base that's only getting more and more sophisticated. Because if you look at what's happened to marketing higher ed, certainly in the last decade, with the, again, sophisticated online marketing techniques and data mining and it, artificial intelligence and chats and chat bots and everything else. If you don't have a relationship with your marketing department, then one of you is going to end up in another job. That's my opinion. At Santa Clara, marketing is in the uh, college relations division. And when that was an open position, I volunteered to chair the search for my friend, who's the VP for development, who used to be an enrollment guy. So it worked out well. And she knew who her most important customer was. Adam, I'd like to just double down on what Dr. Jones said, which I think is a really important point. Um, I think sometimes we, we talk about sort of helping our adults and our learners sort of navigate organizational systems and, and organizational structures. But I, I also think it's really incumbent upon colleges to think more about their talent acquisition strategies when it comes to their own human capital and are you hiring individuals that have a kind of agility to kind of work outside of their function um, and to and to, you know, have that kind of sort of change management orientation um, and sort of that system sort of, you know, interdepartment kind of orientation that that fosters the kind of collaboration between you know, different departments. And I think in some cases you can teach it internally and you can, you know, sort of develop it. And in some cases, you may have to buy it, right? And you have to kind of look for that kind of uh, competency when, when hiring, you know, managers and, and, and executives. All of this is ultimately pretty idiosyncratic. And what, what I mean by this is as follows. I mean, uh, this is impressionistic, but this is, uh, I'm betting that the, this impression is actually a very accurate uh, description of what's happening. Small, less selective regional private colleges are now putting marketing within enrollment management because they've come to the realization that their most predictable source of revenue right. is coming from admissions. <clears throat> you're gonna, if, if you work long enough, you're going to find uh, marketing folks who think they know better than you do. I remember consulting at one it's unnamed large state public institution where marketing was responsible for recruitment and they had these great ideas like putting up billboards in ski, ski resort areas because people come from all over the country. Well, everybody knows there's no way to track the efficacy of that. You don't have a, an, an ex, uh, uh, during my tenure at IU, uh, there was a very strong and influential vice president for public, public relations and marketing. His staff provided a lot of service for, they did a lot of market research for us. It was really helpful. I would hear sometimes at meetings that he would take the credit for all new students. And you have to make decisions. Are you going to fight that? Right. How, right. how much do you care about it? As, uh, and then there are some situations, I think, like this large public institution where uh, that may be a real battle and may be a real blockage to ever being real, as successful as you would like to be. I have a feeling uh, a president like Bob Scott would know where the truth lies and who's taking uh, credit uh, here and there. You know, what, one thing that I see a lot in higher ed is alumni, uh, you know, that serve on the board, 
or that have other uh, honorary or advisory positions have incredible influence. I know an alum, very successful financially at Michigan State, basically got uh, Michigan State to build a school of medicine uh, outside of East Lansing because he wanted it uh, in another part of Michigan where they are developing the health services corridor. And you know other examples in football athletics. What about, and I throw this out to whomever wants to grab this question, what about finding an alum who's a returning student, him or herself, who's gone on to have a successful, uh, prominent life and making that alum the cheerleader for this, the advocate for this? Is that another route to success? I think, you know, we all want ambassadors, right? We have student tour guides, we have alumni ambassadors who fill a niche. I think there's a lot to be learned from our grad units. They're probably more entrepreneurial than the undergrad. They have part-time MBAs, part-time law school, online degrees. They've done that much easier and more quickly, not easier, more quickly than undergrad. But in most cases, and I'll speak to Santa Clara, the online MBA, they outsourced most of the work for that. They didn't hire five new FTE to do this. As a great example of what Don was talking about, of well thought out, researched, vetted, we're gonna try this and grow it slowly with reasonable expectations, but it worked. And I think part of that flexibility that they had to build into the curriculum in terms of credit hours and time frames and all that has to go into a, a non nine to five world. And if you've had grad operations, you know, our business school is open probably 18 hours a day. Right. And yep. anybody who's a president says that makes use for that expensive building to be open then with customers, right? Another point of leverage is the agenda of the board of trustees. Um, presumably the head of enrollment management meeting with the president uh, will have the opportunity to talk about reports to the board, especially since board members are reading in the newspapers and, and AGB trusteeship, et cetera, about demographics and about decline and potential enrollment and a presentation on enrollment strategies. Here's our goal, here are our strategies, here are the populations we're talking to or in talking about, uh, not only tr transfers and new students, but also those who we want to re-enter. Uh, getting the board engaged in this discussion uh, should not be a, a great challenge and could be very, very helpful. I think too, if I can interject, I think you know employers are key too. Yeah. If you look at one of the newest trends in higher education, and it's growing, you know, exponentially right now, is is education as a benefit. Uh, yeah. You know, you look at some, you know, you look at the famous cases that everybody talks about. It kind of started with Starbucks. Disney Aspire is huge. You know, you've got Uber, you've got Chipotle, you've got other people who are working. They realized that as the uh, demographic shifts occur in higher education, the same demographic shifts are happening with workers. And you've got to have talent coming up through the pipeline, or we're going to have a lot of empty chairs in a lot of organizations in 10 years. And so, you know, the way to both recruit and retain top-notch talent to these organizations is through, in many cases, offering them education. Uh, you know, I, I, do, I don't pretend to be an expert on the Starbucks model that ASU did, but I, I've studied enough to tell you that their promotability from within went up approximately 50%. Their retention overall went up approximately 25% for their workforce. And they, in fact, started out down this path of, hey, only food service degrees, only business degrees. And they ultimately decided, you know what, if these people are studying poetry yeah, and right. they have reached some sort of, you know, in, in intellectual satisfaction and they're earning their living at Starbucks, they're more likely to stick around and continue working there and 
in fact, rise up through the ranks and become leaders. So, you know, this is a trend that is not going to go away. How do we tap in to become partners with our, with our employers to reach out to these non finishers, if you will, that are working in these organizations and say, Hey, let's power these people back through. Let's get them every advantage we can, including financial to go back to school. And I think it's a powerful uh, movement that we're only beginning to see the, uh, now. And I think, you know, again, it, the, to me, we're entering, entering the age of collaboration. There's a lot of institutions that are going to have a difficult time yes. continuing to stand on their own. If we don't find a way to partner with people, whether they're third party providers, whether they're consulting groups, or whether there are other higher education institutions that we can collaborate with, or their employers, but it's absolutely you, critical that no one's the last, uh, the last person in the fort, right? You've got to get some partners on board. Well, we are uh, almost uh, coming to the end of our time together here. And I uh, want to thank all of our uh, panel members and all of you who've been watching. And uh, we are going to capture the findings uh, and the key discussion elements in a white paper that we'll be distributing. Um, and so please stand by for that. And of course, we have the emails of those of you who signed up today. And I just had a, a final thought. I was um, renting a car the other day, and it's been a few years uh, since I've been in the age group where it says, you cannot rent a car if you're not 25 years of age. And it really did strike me that we ask a lot of young people at age 17 or 18, we ask them to make big decisions. And in fact, the whole high school experience is about leading up to this big decision. And yet we uh, collectively as a capitalist society with insurance and everything else, won't let these same people uh, rent a, a car for various reasons. So it strikes me, and I think all of you agree, um, we don't have to give up on students when they hit 25, 26, and they haven't gotten that degree. These things are difficult, they take time, and they really enliven the campus. I know you have seen courses, and I've been in classrooms. You know, it is amazing when you see a veteran who served in Afghanistan or in Iraq, who's now 28 or 29, with 17 and 18 year olds. It raises the level of the discussion and the maturity in the classroom for everybody. So I think this has been a great discussion and I really uh, appreciate you joining us. Thanks to the National Digital Roundtable for convening us, my footpath for supporting this discussion. Further details are available at myfootpath.com. And I wish all of you a good afternoon. Thank you.